I want to talk about today is this idea of the craft of legal scholarship. Um, and my starting point for this is that when we often, as legal scholars, talk about method, we talk about training, a word which is really very boring. And we talk about sort of methods training as the first thing you do when you start off being a kind of doctoral legal scholar. And that separates out method from legal scholarship. And my argument today is to really say, no, we need to think about method as part of a bigger picture about legal scholarship. Now that might sound a bit vague at the moment, but what I want to do in my presentation today is three things. First of all, I want to start off by talking about two current change challenges that are occurring in thinking about scholarship. And I want to show how those challenges highlight how we need to think more carefully as legal scholars about what legal scholarship is. And so secondly, I want to think about what is legal scholarship and what are its features. And then the third thing I want to do is out of that, I want to show how a productive way of thinking about what we're doing is this idea of legal scholarship as a craft. Now, a couple of um, points before I start. First of all, I have written about some of this. There is the piece from the Journal of Environmental Law. Um, and myself and Sanya Bogajevic, my lovely colleague here in Oxford, we are currently writing a book called The Craft of Legal Scholarship. And what that means is what I'm presenting here today is also something I've been thinking about for over a decade, but is also still a work in progress. The second thing I should note is I'm using craft here both as a conceptual idea, but also as a metaphor. Um, and you're going to see lots of pictures of quilts <laughs> um, in this presentation. Um, and um, just uh, this is my showy off bit. I've made these quilts. Um, and one of the things I've been doing in recent years is learning a new craft skill as a way to get myself thinking about what are we doing in legal scholarship. Um, and that has been really useful for me to get some epistemic distance from what we do as scholars. Okay, so they're my two points to start off. Okay, so let's talk about two current challenges. Um, the background picture here is uh, an art installation from the Tate Britain, Cornelia Parker, blew up a garden shed. Um, and this is what resulted when she blew it up. Okay, so what, what is blowing up legal scholarship at the moment? Well, the first thing, and this is something that I have discovered um, being a journal uh, editor, is the rise of academic paper mills. Um, now, hopefully you have never come across these. You may have come across student um, paper mills, but these are paper mills being used by academics. Now, um, there is a lot of interest of these in academic publishing. Um, a report that came out last year from COPE and STM to academic publishing associations described paper mills as the process by which manufactured ma manuscripts are submitted to a journal for a fee on behalf of researchers with the purpose of providing an easy publication for them or to offer authorship of sat by sale. And what these are, are submissions that will go into journals. They often have five kind of authors. They're often of a certain length. Um, they're striking because when you read them, they're quite empty. They, they, they read as quite articulate, but they say pretty much nothing at all. And the idea behind these is these are submitted by a company who has produced these articles. And if a journal nibbles on them, then um, they basically sell an author slot. And when I mean nibble, a journal might say, we're interested, but you need to do major revisions. Now, to me, this is pretty shocking, <laughs> um, but it highlights there is a market for people to buy these author slots. And that reflects the fact that as scholars, what we produce has significance for our career. And so people are often driven to taking these kind of actions. Um, 
And that is something it also reveals that often an academic article or a piece of work is seen as having more value as a line on my CV than what it substantive, substantively is. Okay, so that's the first example of a challenge. And I should say there are some journals which are getting hundreds and thousands of these paper mill submissions. The second um, is one that I'm sure you've all been talking about already, and that is the rise of AI and chat GPT. Um, and of course, what we're seeing, and this is something I did on Wednesday, um, here's a question, here's a prompt that I gave to um, chat GPT, is climate change litigation a good thing? Um, good thing clearly being a deeply academic kind of question. Um, this is what it produced in about one minute. Um, you won't need to read it in um, detail, but what we can see is the answer says, this is what climate change litigation is. Um, these are the factors about why it might be a good thing. Here are some complexities. Um, it might be a useful tool, um, but you know there are kind of complexities. Now, what I find really interesting about this is this is not a silly answer. Although there are, if anyone's played round with chat GPT, it can give some very silly answers. But this is actually quite a thoughtful kind of balanced answer. Um, and that raises a question. As Sean Bayern um, at Florida State in a recent piece has argued, he said, if this is what is produced from a prompt, and this immediately appears, this cannot be the height of humanistic kind of thinking. But both these examples raise questions about a paper mills and chat GPT scholarship. Um, and it, at this stage, I'd be tempted to let's get into a discussion, um, but I've been told we'll have discussion at the end. I think most people would say, no, these are not scholarships. Um, but of course, that then raised the question about what is scholarship. Um, and to me, that requires us to go back to basics and think about what is legal scholarship. And what is striking is we do it, but we rarely think about what it is we're doing and, you know, what makes it scholarship. Now, my favourite definition of legal scholarship comes from Professor David Feldman who was a professor in Cambridge for many years. Um, he's recently retired. This is an article that he wrote in the Modern Law Review in 1988 called The Nature of Legal Scholarship. Um, it is a piece that I keep on my desk um, and I am constantly going back to, to because it provides me with the most useful definition of what I do in my work. So let me quote from Feldman. In all fields, scholarship involves curiosity about the world, which may be stimulated either by the need to achieve a goal or by desire to understand something for its own sake. It is the attempt to understand something by a person who is guided by certain ideals, which distinguishes scholarship both from the single-minded pursuit of an end and from dilettantism. Now, he then defines legal scholarship as really any scholarship which is studying problems in relation to law. And he says there really are three ideals that we can identi identify. First of all, a commitment to the suitable methods for the kind of questions or the inquiry that you're making. Secondly, this idea of self-reflective open-mindedness. And thirdly, a commitment to publish, although I'll come back to that, to illuminate an audience. Now, there are a couple of things I really, really like about this definition. First of all, it's inclusive. And one of the problems, and I'll talk about this in a moment, um, that we get in legal scholarship is a temptation for scholars to say, the type of scholarship I do is fantastic. The type of scholarship you do is not so fantastic. Um, and that, that is not something which is a healthy way to think about. This is, this is an inclusive definition. 
The second thing um, to note about this is this idea about sort of how we behave. And again, I'll, I'll expand on this in a moment. Um, he's focusing on the outlook of the scholar and the kind of values of scholarship. And that to me moves us away from that kind of training and methods to thinking about how does this go to the heart of what we are doing as scholars. And the third thing is this idea that what we are doing is illuminating our audience. Um, illuminating is a really interesting word. It's about casting lights on things that haven't necessarily had a light. And, and for me, when I read a piece of scholarship that opens up new ways of thinking, it is really exciting. There is nothing like as a reader to be illuminated. Okay, so just a couple of things to note. First of all, as I've already stressed, this definition has, is not about a single method or mode. And much of the, the kind of discussion about method in legal scholarship is often about saying there are methods which are or modes or types which are more superior than others. Um, so, for example, in the UK, there has been a kind of ongoing debate over 30 years about whether doctrinal legal scholarship is better or worse than socio-legal kind of empirical scholarship. Um, one recent example of this is Lord Burroughs, who is on the UK Supreme Court, but for many years was a professor here in Oxford, um, delivered a lecture a couple of years ago arguing for the importance of practical legal scholarship that was useful um, for judges. And of course, he was responding to those who said, oh, doctrinal, that kind of scholarship is really, really boring. So, but, but Feldman's definition is recognizing, well, actually there are lots of methods. The important thing is a method which suits the kind of inquiry that you're making. The second thing to note is um, that scholarship can be for a range of purposes. So sometimes scholarship is just for kind of, you know, getting at the truth in a kind of very abstract way. Sometimes, and often within law, we are, um, scholarship is, is sort of on the edges of practice. Feldman's definition is recognizing that we might be doing it for a range of purposes, and that is okay. Um, just to give you an example, there some of you might have been following a recent debate about scholar activism. You know, should scholarship be produced to have particular kind of in policy impacts, et cetera? Um, and there has been an interesting on um, sort of back and forth between a range of public law academics. What Feldman's definition is saying, yeah, is you may have a it for a range of purposes. That's fine. What matters is how you behave. And that's my third point, that idea about how one behaves, the integrity. Um, and the question is, well, what does that practically mean? And I will come to that um, in a moment. The fourth point to make is this idea, again, of illuminating an audience. Um, young scholars are often given a range of advice. Um, you know, your piece of scholarship must make an argument or your piece of scholarship must have a policy recommendation or your piece of scholarship must do that. My feeling is that there are lots of different ways that you can illuminate an audience. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can get a reader to think differently. And that's particularly the case in legal scholarship. Um, in another recent piece I've done on method in judicial review scholarship, I made the point that in public law, it's often like um, the old joke of th that someone comes across a drunk man who's looking for his car keys under a kind of light, under a street light. And the person says, well, why, why are you looking under this street light? And um, the man says, because this is where I can see. To me, a lot of legal scholarship clusters round existing kind of issues. And yet there is so much going on in law. 
there is so much to illuminate. Um, there is so much which is kind of uncovered, but people sort of think, oh, no, I must write about these topics, not these topics which have gone unilluminated. The final point to make um, is that as scholars, we are not just bowerbirds. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever come across the Australian satin bowerbird, which is what the picture is there. So the Australian satin bowerbird um, makes nests and in its nests, it collects blue things. Um, and that was because before humans kind of uh, European civilization, um, in Australia, blue was a kind of quite rare colour, it only came in flowers. But of course, what has happened since then, and you can see this from the photo, um, is that the bowerbird collects bottle tops, pegs, straws, bits of plastic. Um, and that is often a tempting form of scholarship in the field that I, I kind of started out with. There are many pieces which collect examples of risk and law together in a kind of random way. But that is not scholarship. That is more being like a dilettante. And this is, I think, where we can begin to see how scholarship differs from chat GPT. Chat GPT is very much just like a very sophisticated search engine. It brings stuff together, it assembles it, but it's not necessarily doing much more. Okay, so that, that is sort of thinking about what legal scholarship is. Now, let me turn to thinking about this idea of legal scholarship as craft. Um, and just a couple of things to note about this concept of craft. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of using it as a metaphor here, but it is also being used as a concept. Um, craft is, is really a very fashionable concept at the moment in a wide range of um, discourses. And of course, ideas of craft, we often think of as going back to medieval guilds, that kind of thing. But discussion of craft and the use of the um, idea of craft is often a response to industrialization. So here in the UK, um, you saw what is known as the arts and crafts movement, a kind of commitment to making things well, emerging in response to industrialization in the Victorian era. And one could argue that our, this kind of focus on craft that we're seeing now in scholarship is a response to what one might think of as the industrialization of scholarship and chat GPT is an example of that. Okay, so what are we thinking about when we are thinking about craft? Well, there are a range of different definitions of craft out there, but to me, the starting point is that to engage in an exercise of craft is to produce a product through working with materials. So, um, First of all, this idea that we are as scholars producing a product. We are not garrets, we are not sort of art, great art, tortured artists in our garrets, thinking great thoughts, but never actually having <laughs> to produce anything. Our jobs are to produce things. Um, and it's important that we do, and it's important that we produce useful knowledge, although we might want to expand on that. And we do that with working through materials. And to me, talking about craft, the craft of legal scholarship um, is really focusing on that our starting point for being scholars is not actually method. Our starting point is our relationship with materials. Um, the artist Grayson Perry has talked about craftsmanship as a humble hands-on ever love of stuff. And to me, developing my, my skills and my expertise as a scholar is really about developing that relationship with the materials, whether they be primary or secondary that I'm working with. So that's the starting point. And then the argument is, is method comes from that relationship with that material. The second point to note about craft is that it is very individualized work. Um, I'm sure you've often heard the life of a scholar is a lonely life. Um, you know, you were there with the books and writing um, or not writing as the case may be. 
Um, but it's also occurring as a part of a community. We gain our expertise from that community, from our interactions with that community, and we are also writing for that community. And so as Feldman has noted, you know, scholarship is always balancing communitarianism and individualism. And that recognizing that and recognizing that relationship is really, really important. And the third thing to note about craft is as Richard Sennett and his book, The Craftsman has noted, it is quality driven work. We care about quality. Um, Sennett describes how quality driven work requires us to use as scholars, the obsessive energy of wanting to do a good job. And to me, that was really the starting point where I started thinking about craft because that idea that you know, we want to do a good job. That is an obsession. And that is an energy which drives, drives us forward. But it's also an energy which can be quite a negative energy. It can lead to writer's block. It can lead to not producing things. And it can also lead to a sort of showing off. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So they're the kind of three features. Okay, you might be thinking so far, this is all lovely. There are some pretty colorful pictures I'm showing you. What does this mean for us as scholars? And that's what I really want to get to um, in this last slide. And this gives you a feeling for what the book that I'm working on with Sanya is going um, to cover. So in a sense, there are five steps that we are kind of thinking about. Um, in putting forward this book. The first is that in thinking about any scholarly product that we are producing, we are always doing it for a purpose. And it's really useful to think about well, what is that purpose? So sometimes that purpose is part of a formal process of, you know, being assessed, getting a doctorate something like that. Um, sometimes it is part of a kind of intellectual research agenda. But that purpose is going to shape the nature of that product. And thinking carefully about that purpose is really valuable, not in a cynical way, not in a way of saying, oh, well, I just need to, you know, check off it, but saying, you know, these are all different exercises. So in my own scholarship, um, I've done all kinds of things, you know, not only doing a doctorate and that kind of stuff. I've written um, textbooks. I've written um, sort of academic monographs. Um, I've written articles for legal scholars. I've written articles for public law scholars. I've written articles for scientists. I've written um, a book where I was told that the remit was um, Guardian readers. And that's probably the most biggest project that I've had to kind of struggle with. So, so that purpose is really important and is the starting point. And that purpose highlights, I think, three different things. First of all, the importance of community. How does this, you know, how does this exercise, this scholarly product relate to particular communities? Now, one of the features of legal scholarship is we have many different communities we might be speaking to. And that's going to shape the purpose. Um, we often think that we can speak to all audiences, and this is the second point, but we can't. You know, we need to think about well, which audience are we speaking to and why are we speaking to it and how does that relate to the purpose? And the third point to note is this about expertise. Um, so as scholars, we are experts and we are gaining expertise. Um, and in a sense, scholarship is a product of our expertise, but it is also often proving that we have that expertise. And that can be quite complex, <laughs> um, but it's useful to think about what product relates to how one's expertise is being developed. So one of the, the biggest challenges I think doctoral students have is that they often forget that what they're really doing is effectively an apprenticeship, a first step in the scholarly process. 
Um, and it's an important step and it's important to do well, but it's not the same as, John, you know, writing um, like John Rawls at the height of his intellectual powers. And it can be very easy to confuse those two things and think that's what you've got to do. Um, in thinking about expertise, and this comes back to chat GPT, there are two types of expertise we might think about here in terms of scholarly expertise. Um, one is a kind of what we think of as explicit knowledge, this idea that I tell you something and then you know it. Chat GPT again. But really scholarship is the product of what is tacit expertise. I, it's a bit like riding a bicycle. And that comes to the second box, the gray box. At the heart of that expertise is the fidelity to material that you're working with. That hands on love of the material. Um, and to me, you know, what we are doing as scholars is developing an innate understanding of legal material. What is it that we can expect from primary or secondary material? What is a good exercise of reasoning? What is a bad exercise of reasoning? That is, that is what we are trying to develop as part of our scholarly expertise. The second aspect to note of fidelity to material is in my experience, most scholars do not start off with a research question. This is often people say, oh, you must start off with a research question. Um, that's not how I see most of my doctoral students um, who I engage with start. What they start with is an intellectual itch. They've read something, they've read a case, and I'm talking in terms of common law method here, and it's made them really mad. Or they've read someone's work and it's really, that there's a problem with it, but they don't know how to express it. Or they're interested in a particular idea. So to me, where often we start as scholars is not with a question, is not with method. We start with the material and our interest and our love of the, that kind of material. And out of that then grows the question. That then brings me to the third step, what um, Sanya and I call macro method. And this returns me to Feldman. Um, the methods we use must relate to the materials that we're working with and the kind of issues that we are interested in exploring. And the best methods, the best intellectual processes relate to those materials and purposes. So there is no one single method which is superior in legal scholarship. There are methods which are better for the questions and the materials that we're working with. And what that also means is as legal scholars, we are in a sense often using different methods. And again, if I look at my work over time, I've used all types of methods and I've had to learn those methods. But my starting point is not to say, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to learn all these methods? My starting point has always been thinking about the material and how does one do justice um, to that material and to what I'm interested in that material. That brings me to the blue blocks. And this is one which I don't think we really focus on enough as legal scholarships, as legal scholars, but is really important. And that is what we call micro method, the process of writing and communicating. If you're a creative writer, you spend a lot of time in writing workshops. You spend a lot of time thinking about language, about how you express yourself. In legal scholarship, we don't talk enough about the writing process. How do we illuminate? How do we write clearly and thoughtfully? How do we engage with our audience? And more importantly, how do we deal with problems such as writer's block? Um, I've experienced writer's block. Every single doctoral student that I have ever supervised has gone through writer's block at some stage. And yet it's something we don't talk about. We often treat 
the process of writing as if we are almost like chat GPT. We sit down, we have a prompt and we type away and it all appears. But that process of thinking about how do we write well is incredibly important and how do we communicate with our audience. And, and something I would note in um, you know, the process of editing, a lot of the process of editing isn't often about the substance of ideas, it's about how people communicate with their audience. Okay, the third and the um, kind of final green box. The elephant in the room is the question of quality. Craft work is quality um, driven work. And one way to think about quality is to say that there is one mode of scholarship and that mode of scholarship is quality and other modes um, are not quality. Everything I've said has made clear that's not the way that we can think about it. Legal scholarship is methodologically pluralistic, long may that last. But what it means is that when we are talking about quality and scholarly quality, there is no simple template by which to judge things. But what I would suggest is the four previous box, boxes helps us begin to have an understanding of what we mean by quality. It is about the fidelity to material. It is about having an understanding of your audience. It is about using methods which work for the material that you're working with. It is about writing and communicating. These are the features that you're working with. And in, in thinking about that way, we allow diversity, but we also ensure quality. But quality also, and this really brings me back to academic paper mills, is that as scholars, we are in the evaluation business. We don't often describe it that way, but that's what we are in. And I mean that in two different ways. One is we are constantly evaluating the work of others whether through the substance of what we're writing or as you're an academic, that's what you spend a lot of time doing. <laughs> but we are also constantly being evaluated. And developing as part of a scholar, a healthy relationship with the evaluation process, with evaluation processes is incredibly important. Now, this then leads, and there is a chapter of the book, which I haven't put here, but just to um, kind of flag, is this then brings us back to community. Scholarship is only ever going to be good as the communities that it's occurring in. Um, and I'm passionate about this stuff because, to be quite honest, the doctoral students of today are the academic leaders of tomorrow. And how we build communities and how we foster them and what we lay down as the templates for good action and, and, and kind of bad action are really, really important. And to me, again, craft provides a way of not just only helping individual scholars, but also helping us thinking about how do we build healthier kind of communities. Okay, I'm nearly out of time. Conclusion. Um, this really brings me back to where I started. Um, we live in really interesting times. Um, and that brings with it threats. Um, it brings with it lots of paper mill submissions. But it also brings with it the importance of now more than ever as legal scholars, we need to have an understanding of what we're doing. We need an understanding of our craft. And my hope is actually that will lead to better legal scholarship. We need to think more carefully, um, but through doing that, there are really exciting possibilities. Um, so I'm gonna end it there um, and thank you very much. <laughs>